Good evening. I hope you've had a great day today. Welcome to BBJ's Bedtime Stories. I'm Big Voice J, and this is the show where we get you ready for a good night's sleep with public domain short stories just for you. Links to all the stories can be found in the show notes at bedtimewithbvj.com. And if you'd like to support the show, there's a buy me a coffee link in every post. Tonight we continue our story, The Naval Treaty, by Arthur Conan Doyle. The invalid sank back upon his cushions, tired out by this long recital, while his nurse poured him out a glass of some stimulating medicine. Holmes sat silently, with his head thrown back and his eyes closed, in an attitude which might seem listless to a stranger, but which I knew betokened the most intense self-absorption. "'Your statement has been so explicit,' said he at last, "'that you've really left me very few questions to ask. "'There is one of the very utmost importance, however. "'Did you tell anyone that you had this special task to perform?' "'No one. "'Not Miss Harrison here, for example. "'No, I had not been back to walking between getting the order and executing the commission.' And none of your people had, by chance, been to see you? None. Did any of them know their way about in the office? Oh, yes. All of them had been shown over it. Still, of course, if you said nothing to anyone about the treaty, these inquiries are irrelevant. I said nothing. Do you know anything of the commissionaire? Nothing, except that he's an old soldier. But regiment? Oh, I have heard. Uh, Coldstream Guards. Thank you. I have no doubt I can get details from Forbes. The authorities are excellent at amassing facts, though they do not always use them to advantage. What a lovely thing a rose is. He walked past the couch to the open window and held up the drooping stalk of a moss rose looking down at the dainty blend of crimson and green. It was a new phase of his character to me, for I had never before seen him show any keen interest in natural objects. There is nothing in which deduction is so necessary as in religion, said he, leaning with his back against the shutters. It can be built up as an exact science by the reasoner. Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence Seems to me to rest in the flowers. All other things, our powers, our desires, our food, were all really necessary for our existence in the first instance. But this rose is an extra. Its smell and its color are an embellishment of life, not a condition of it. It is only goodness which gives extras, and so I say again that We have much to hope from the flowers. Percy Phelps and his nurse looked at Holmes during this demonstration with surprise and a good deal of disappointment written upon their faces. He had fallen into a reverie with the moss rose between his fingers. It had lasted some minutes before the young lady broke in upon it. Do you see any prospect of solving this mystery, Mr. Holmes? she asked with a touch of asperity in her voice. Oh, the mystery, he answered, coming back with a start to the realities of life. Well, it would be absurd to deny that the case is a very abstruse and complicated one, but I can promise you that I will look into the matter and let you know any points which may strike me. Do you see any clue? You have furnished me with seven, but... Of course, I must test them before I can pronounce upon their value. You suspect someone? I suspect myself. What? Of coming to conclusions too rapidly. Then go to London and test your conclusions. Your advice is very excellent, Miss Harrison, said Holmes, rising. I think, Watson, we cannot do better. Do not allow yourself to indulge in false hopes, Mr. Phelps. The affair is a very tangled one. I shall be in a fever until I see you again, cried the diplomatist. 
Well, I'll come out by the same train tomorrow, though it's more than likely that my report will be a negative one. God bless you for promising to come, cried our client. It gives me fresh life to know that something is being done. By the way, I have had a letter from Lord Holdhurst. Ah, what did he say? He was cold, but not harsh. I dare say my severe illness prevented him from being that. He repeated that the matter was of the utmost importance, and added that no steps would be taken about my future, by which he means, of course, my dismissal, until my health was restored, and I had an opportunity of repairing my misfortune. Well, that was reasonable and considerate, said Holmes. Come, Watson, for we have a good day's work before us in town. Mr. Joseph Harrison drove us down to the station, and we were soon whirling up in a Portsmouth train. Holmes was sunk in profound thought, and hardly opened his mouth until we had passed Clapham Junction. It's a very cheery thing to come into London by any of these lines which run high, and allow you to look down upon the houses like this. I thought he was joking, for the view was sordid enough, but he soon explained himself. Look at those big, isolated clumps of building rising up above the slates, like brick islands in a lead-colored sea. The board schools, lighthouses, my boy, beacons of the future, capsules with hundreds of bright little seeds in each, out of which will spring the wise, better England of the future. I suppose that man Phelps does not drink. I should not think so. Nor should I, but we are bound to take every possibility into account. The poor devil has certainly got himself into very deep water, and it's a question whether we shall ever be able to get him ashore. What did you think of Miss Harrison? A girl of strong character. Yes, but she is a good sort, or I am mistaken. She and her brother are the only children of an iron master somewhere up Northumberland Way. He got engaged to her when traveling last winter, and she came down to be introduced to his people with her brother as escort. Then came the smash, and she stayed on to nurse her lover, while brother Joseph, finding himself pretty snug, stayed on too. I've been making a few independent inquiries, you see. But today must be a day of inquiries. My practice, I began. Oh, if you find your own case is more interesting than mine, said Holmes, with some asperity. I was going to say that my practice could get along very well for a day or two, since it is the slackest time in the year. Excellent, said he, recovering his good humor. Then we'll look into this matter together. I think that we should begin by seeing Forbes. He can probably tell us all the details we want until we know from what side the case is to be approached. You said you had a clue. Well, we have several. But we can only test their value by further inquiry. The most difficult crime to track is the one which is purposeless. Now, this is not purposeless. Who is it that profits by it? There's the French ambassador, there's the Russian, there is whoever might sell it to either of them, and there is Lord Holdhurst. Lord Holdhurst? Well, it is just conceivable that a statesman might find himself in a position where he was not sorry to have such a document accidentally destroyed. Not a statesman with the honorable record of Lord Holdhurst? It is a possibility, and we cannot afford to disregard it. We shall see the noble lord today and find out if he can tell us anything. Meanwhile, I have already set inquiries on foot. Already? Yes, I sent wires from Woking Station to every evening paper in London. This advertisement will appear in each of them. He handed over a sheet, torn from a notebook. On it was scribbled in pencil. Ten pound reward. The number of the cab which dropped a fare at or about the door of the foreign office in Charles Street at quarter to ten in the evening of May 23rd. Apply 221B, Baker Street. You're confident 
that the thief came in a cab. If not, then there's no harm done. But if Mr. Phelps is correct in stating that there's no hiding place either in the room or the corridors, then the person must have come from outside. If he came from outside on so wet a night, and yet left no trace of damp upon the linoleum, which was examined within a few minutes of his passing, then it is exceeding probably that he came in a cab. Yes, I think that we may safely deduce a cab. It sounds plausible. That is one of the clues of which I spoke. It may lead us to something, and then, of course, there's the bell, which is the most distinctive feature of the case. Why should the bell ring? Was it the thief who did it out of bravado, or was it someone who was with the thief who did it in order to prevent the crime? Or was it an accident? Or was it? He sank back into the state of intense and silent thought from which he had emerged, but it seemed to me, accustomed as I was to his every mood, that some new possibility had dawned suddenly upon him. It was twenty past three when we reached our terminus, and after a hasty luncheon at the buffet, we pushed on over at once to Scotland Yard. Holmes had already wired to Forbes, and we found him waiting to receive us, a small, foxy man with a sharp, but by no means amiable expression. He was decidedly frigid in his manner to us, especially when he heard the errand upon which we had come. "'I've heard of your methods before now, Mr. Holmes,' said he tartly. "'You are ready enough to use all the information that the police can lay at your disposal, "'and then you try to finish your case yourself and bring discredit on them.' "'On the contrary,' said Holmes. "'Out of my last fifty-three cases, my name has only appeared in four, "'and the police have had all the credit in forty-nine. "'I don't blame you for not knowing this, for you are young,' and inexperienced, but if you wish to get on in your new duties, you will work with me and not against me. I'd be very glad of a hint or two, said the detective, changing his manner. I've certainly had no credit from the case so far. What steps have you taken? Tanji, the commissionaire, has been shadowed. He left the guards with a good character, and we can find nothing against him. His wife is a bad lot, though. I fancy she knows more about this than appears. Have you shadowed her? We have sent one of our women on to her. Mrs. Tangy drinks, and our woman has been with her twice when she was well on, but she could get nothing out of her. I understand that they've had brokers in the house. Yes, but they were paid off. Where did the money come from? That was all right. His pension was due. They have not shown any sign of being in funds. What explanation did she give of having answered the bell when Mr. Phelps rang for the coffee? She said that her husband was very tired and she wished to relieve him. Well, certainly that would agree with his being found a little later asleep in his chair. There's nothing against them then, but the woman's character. Did you ask her why she hurried away that night? Her haste attracted the attention of the police constable. She was later than usual and wanted to get home. Did you point out to her that you and Mr. Phelps, who started at least twenty minutes after he got home before her? She explains that by the difference between a bus and a hansom. Did she make it clear why, upon reaching her house, she ran into the back kitchen? Because she had the money there with which to pay off the brokers. She has at least an answer for everything. Did you ask her whether in leaving she met anyone or saw anyone loitering about Charles Street? She saw no one but the constable. Well, you seem to have cross-examined her pretty thoroughly. What else have you done? The clerk Garou has been shadowed all these nine weeks, but without results. We can show nothing against him. Anything else? Well, we have nothing else to go upon. No evidence of any kind. 
Have you formed a theory about how that bell rang? Well, I must confess that it beats me. It was a cool hand, whoever it was, to go and give the alarm like that. Yes, it was an odd thing to do. Many thanks to you for what you've told me. If I can put the man into your hands, you shall hear from me. Come along, Watson. Where are we going to now? I asked as we left the office. We are now going to interview Lord Holhurst, the cabinet minister and future premier of England. We were fortunate in finding that Lord Holthurst was still in his chambers in Downing Street, and on home sending in his card, we were instantly shown up. The statesman received us with that old-fashioned courtesy for which he is remarkable, and seated us on the two luxuriant lounges on either side of the fireplace. Standing on the rug between us with his slight, tall figure, his sharp features, thoughtful face, and curling hair prematurely tinged with grey, he seemed to represent that not-too-common type, a nobleman who is, in truth, noble. "'Your name is very familiar to me, Mr. Holmes,' said he, smiling. "'And, of course, I cannot pretend to be ignorant of the object of your visit. There has been only one occurrence in these offices which could call for your attention.' "'In whose interest are you acting, may I ask?' "'In that of Mr. Percy Phelps,' answered Holmes. "'Ah, my unfortunate nephew, "'you can understand that our kinship "'makes it the more impossible for me to screen him in any way. "'I fear that the incident must have a very prejudicial effect upon his career. "'But if the document is found,' Ah, that, of course, would be different. I had one or two questions which I wish to ask you, Lord Holdhurst. I shall be happy to give you any information in my power. Was it in this room that you gave your instructions as to the copying of the document? It was. Then you could hardly have been overheard. It is out of the question. Did you ever mention to anyone that it was your intention to give anyone the treaty to be copied? Never. You are certain of that? Absolutely. Well, since you never said so, and Mr. Phelps never said so, and nobody else knew anything of the matter, then the thief's presence in the room was purely accidental. He saw his chance, and he took it. The statesman smiled. "'You take me out of my province there,' said he. Holmes considered for a moment. "'There is another very important point which I wish to discuss with you,' said he. "'You feared, as I understand, that very grave results might follow from the details of this treaty becoming known.' A shadow passed over the expressive face of the statesman. "'Very grave results indeed. And have they occurred?' Not yet. If the treaty had reached, let us say, the French or Russian Foreign Office, you would expect to hear of it. I should, said Lord Holthurst, with a wry face. Since nearly ten weeks have elapsed then, and nothing has been heard, it is not unfair to suppose that for some reason the treaty has not reached them. Lord Holdhurst shrugged his shoulders. We can hardly suppose, Mr. Holmes, that the thief took the treaty in order to frame it and hang it up. Perhaps he's waiting for a better price. If he waits a little longer, he will get no price at all. The treaty will cease to be secret in a few months. That is most important, said Holmes. Of course, it is a possible supposition... That the thief has had a sudden illness, an attack of brain fever, for example, asked the statesman, flashing a swift glance at him. I did not say so, said Holmes imperturbably. And now, Lord Holthurst, we have already taken up too much of your valuable time, and we shall wish you good day. Every success to your investigation, be the criminal who it may, answered the nobleman, as he bowed us out the door. "'He's a fine fellow,' said Holmes, as we came out into Whitehall. "'But he has a struggle to keep up his position. "'He's far from rich and has many calls.' 
you noticed, of course, that his boots had been resold. Now, Watson, I won't detain you from your legitimate work any longer. I shall do nothing more today, unless I have an answer to my cab advertisement. But I should be extremely obliged to you if you'd come down with me to walking tomorrow by the same train which we took yesterday. I met him accordingly next morning, and we traveled down to walking together. He'd had no answer to his advertisement, he said, and no fresh light had been thrown upon the case. He had, when he so willed it, the utter immobility of countenance of a red Indian, and I could not gather from his appearance whether he was satisfied or not with the position of the case. His conversation, I remember, was about the Bertillon system of measurements, and he expressed his enthusiastic admiration of the French savant. We found our client still under the charge of his devoted nurse, but looking considerably better than before. He rose from the sofa and greeted us without difficulty when we entered. Any news? he asked eagerly. My report, as I expected, is a negative one, said Holmes. I have seen Forbes, and I have seen your uncle, and I have set one or two trains of inquiry upon foot, which may lead to something. You have not lost heart, then? By no means. God bless you for saying that, cried Miss Harrison. If we keep our courage and our patience, the truth must come out. We have more to tell you than you have for us, said Phelps, reseating himself upon the couch. I hoped you might have something. Yes, we have had an adventure during the night, and one which might have proved to be a serious one. His expression grew very grave as he spoke, and a look of something akin to fear sprang up in his eyes. Do you know, said he, that I began to believe that I am the unconscious center of some monstrous conspiracy, and that my life is aimed at as well as my honor? Ah, cried Holmes, it sounds incredible, for I have not, as far as I know, an enemy in the world, yet from last night's experience I can come to no other conclusion. Pray let me hear it. You must know that last night was the very first night that I have ever slept without a nurse in the room. I was so much better that I thought I could dispense with one. I had a nightlight burning, however. Well, about two in the morning I had sunk into a light sleep, when I was suddenly aroused by a slight noise. It was like the sound which a mouse makes when it is gnawing a plank, and I lay listening to it for some time under the impression that it must come from that cause. Then it grew louder, and suddenly there came from the window a sharp metallic snick. I sat up in amazement. There could be no doubt what the sounds were now. The first ones had been caused by someone forcing an instrument through the slit between the sashes and the second by the catch being pressed back. There was a pause then for about ten minutes, as if the person were waiting to see whether the noise had awakened me. Then I heard a gentle creaking as the window was very slowly opened. I could stand it no longer, for my nerves are not what they used to be. I sprang out of bed and flung open the shutters. A man was crouching at the window. I could see little of him, for he was gone like a flash. He was wrapped in some sort of cloak which came across the lower part of his face. One thing only I am sure of, and that is that he had some weapon in his hand. It looked to me like a long knife. I distinctly saw the gleam of it as he turned to run. This is most interesting, said Holmes. Pray, what did you do then? I should have followed him through the open window if I had been stronger. As it was, I rang the bell and roused the house. It took me some little time, for the bell rings in the kitchen, and the servants all sleep upstairs. I shouted, however, and that brought Joseph down, and he roused the others. Joseph and the groom found marks on the bed outside the window, but the weather has been so dry lately that they found it hopeless to follow the trail across the grass. There is a place, however, on the wooden fence which skirts the road, which shows signs, they tell me, as if someone had got over, and it snapped the top of the rail in doing so. I have said nothing to the local police yet, for I thought I had best have your opinion first. 
This tale of our clients appeared to have an extraordinary effect upon Sherlock Holmes. He rose from his chair and paced about the room in uncontrollable excitement. Misfortunes never come single, said Phelps, smiling. Though it was evident that his adventure had somewhat shaken him. You have certainly had your share, said Holmes. Do you think you could walk round the house with me? Oh, yes. I should like a little sunshine. Joseph will come, too. And I also, said Miss Harrison. I am afraid not, said Holmes, shaking his head. I think I must ask you to remain sitting exactly where you are. The young lady resumed her seat with an air of displeasure. Her brother, however, had joined us, and we set off all four together. We passed round the lawn to the outside of the young diplomatist's window. There were, as he had said, marks upon the bed, but they were hopelessly blurred and vague. Holmes stopped over them for an instant, and then rose, shrugging his shoulders. "'I don't think anyone could make much of this,' said he. "'Let us go round the house and see why this particular room was chose by the burglar. I should have thought those larger windows of the drawing room and dining room would have had more attractions for him. They are more visible from the road, suggested Mr. Joseph Harrison. Ah, yes, of course. There's a door here, which he might have attempted. What is it for? It is the side entrance for tradespeople. Of course, it is locked at night. Have you ever had an alarm like this before? Never, said our client. Do you keep plate in the house or anything to attract burglars? Nothing of value. Holmes strolled round the house with his hands in his pockets and a negligent air which was unusual with him. By the way, said he to Joseph Harrison, you found some place, I understand, where the fellow scaled the fence. Let us have a look at that. The plump young man led us to a spot where the top of one of the wooden rails had been cracked. A small fragment of the wood was hanging down. Holmes pulled it off and examined it critically. Do you think that was done last night? It looks rather old, does it not? Well, possibly not. There are no marks of anyone jumping down upon the other side. No, I fancy we shall get no help here. Let us go back to the bedroom and talk the matter over. Percy Phelps was walking very slowly, leaning upon the arm of his future brother-in-law. Holmes walked swiftly across the lawn, and we were at the open window of the bedroom long before the others came up. "'Miss Harrison,' said Holmes, speaking with the utmost intensity of manner, "'you must stay where you are all day. Let nothing prevent you from staying where you are all day. It is of the utmost importance.' "'Certainly, if you wish it, Mr. Holmes,' said the girl in astonishment." When you go to bed, lock the door of this room on the outside and keep the key. Promise to do this. But Percy, he will come to London with us. And am I to remain here? It is for his sake. You can serve him. Quick, promise. She gave a quick nod of assent just as the other two came up. Why do you sit moping there, Annie? cried her brother. Come out into the sunshine. No, thank you, Joseph. I have a slight headache, and this room is deliciously cool and soothing. What do you propose now, Mr. Holmes, says our client? Well, in investigating this minor affair, we must not lose sight of our main inquiry. It would be a very great help to me if you would come up to London with us. At once? Well, as soon as you conveniently can. Say, in an hour... I feel quite strong enough. If I can really be of any help, the greatest possible. Perhaps you would like me to stay there tonight? I was just going to propose it. Then, if my friend of the night comes to revisit me, he will find the bird flown. We are all in your hands, Mr. Holmes, and you must tell us exactly what you would like done. Perhaps you would prefer that Joseph came with us? 
so as to look after me? Oh no, my friend Watson is a medical man, you know, and he'll look after you. We'll have our lunch here, if you will permit us, and then we shall all three set off for town together. It was arranged as he suggested, though Miss Harrison excused herself from leaving the bedroom in accordance with Holmes' suggestion. What the object of my friend's maneuvers was, I could not conceive, unless it were to keep the lady away from Phelps, who, rejoiced by his returning health and by the prospect of action, lunched with us in the dining room. Holmes had still more startling surprise for us, however, for after accompanying us down to the station and seeing us into our carriage, he calmly announced that he had no intention of leaving Woking. There are one or two small points which I should desire to clear up before I go, said he. Your absence, Mr. Phelps, will in some ways rather assist me. Watson, when you reach London, you will oblige me by driving at once to Baker Street with our friend here and remaining with him until I see you again. It is fortunate that you are old school fellows, as you must have much to talk over. Mr. Phelps can have the spare bedroom tonight, and I will be with you in time for breakfast, for there is a train which will take me into Waterloo at eight. But how about our investigation in London? asked Phelps ruefully. We can do that tomorrow. I think that just at present I can be of more immediate use here. You might tell them at Briarbrae that I hope to be back tomorrow night, cried Phelps, as we began to move from the platform. I hardly expect to go back to Briarbrae, answered Holmes, and waved his hand to us cheerily as we shot out from the station. Phelps and I talked it over on our journey, but neither of us could devise a satisfactory reason for this new development. I suppose he wants to find out some clue as to the burglary last night. If a burglar it was, for myself, I don't believe it was an ordinary thief. What is your own idea, then? Upon my word, you may put it down to my weak nerves or not, but I believe there's some deep political intrigue going on around me, and that for some reason that passes my understanding. My life is aimed at by the conspirators. It seems high-flown and absurd, but... Consider the facts. Why would a thief try to break in at a bedroom window when there could be no hope of any plunder? And why should he come with a long knife in his hand? You are sure it's not a housebreaker's jimmy? Oh no, it was a knife. I saw the flash of the blade quite distinctly. But why on earth should you be pursued with such animosity? Ah, that is the question. Well... If Holmes takes the same view, that would account for his action, would it not? Presuming that your theory is correct, if he can lay his hands upon the man who threatened you last night, he will have gone a long way towards finding who took the naval treaty. It is absurd to suppose that you have two enemies, one of whom robs you while the other threatens your life. But Holmes said he was not going to Briarbrae. I have known him for some time, said I. I never knew him do anything, yet without a very good reason. And with that, our conversation drifted off into other topics. But it was a weary day for me. Phelps was still weak after his long illness, and his misfortune made him querulous and nervous. In vain, I endeavored to interest him in Afghanistan, in India, in social questions, in anything which might take his mind out of the groove. He would always come back to his lost treaty, wandering, guessing, speculating as to what Holmes was doing, what steps Lord Holdhurst was taking, what news we should have in the morning. As the evening wore on, his excitement became quite painful. You have implicit faith in Holmes, he asked. I have seen him do some remarkable things. But he never brought light into anything quite so dark as this. Oh, yes! I have known himself questions which presented fewer clues than yours, but not where such large interests are at stake. I don't know that. To my certain knowledge, he has acted on behalf of three of the reigning houses of Europe in very vital matters. But you know him well, Watson. He's such an inscrutable fellow that 
I never quite know what to make of him. Do you think he's hopeful? Do you think he expects to make a success of it? He has said nothing. That is a bad sign. On the contrary, I have noticed that when he's off the trail, he generally says so. It is when he is on a scent and is not quite absolutely sure yet that it is the right one that he is most taciturn. Now, my dear fellow, we can't help matters by making ourselves nervous about them. So let me implore you to go to bed and so be fresh for whatever may await us tomorrow. We'll continue our story on our next episode. We are always on the hunt for great stories like these to feature on the show. You can send your suggestions to bigvoicej at gmail.com. We've got a YouTube channel full of stories from the show. Go to tiny.cc slash bvjbedtime. If you found some value in our storytelling tonight, don't forget to show the love. There's a buy me a coffee link on every post. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>